product makes it really hard for, obviously, for the competitors to keep up with you. Um, one of the examples I give is my third company, Xfire. And in that company, we were rolling out, it was an instant messenger for PC video gamers. And we were rolling out a new release of the product every two weeks. And there were sort of some major competitors in the instant messaging space, including AOL. And AOL identified us as a competitor, and they started to sort of design a sort of uh, reaction to our product. But larger companies, it, it was uh, approximately 12 months of their process of identifying, defining the, the product they wanted to, to use to compete against us. And by that time, we already had uh, 24 releases. And so the, the sort of plan for counteracting us was, was not going to work. Um, so one is against competitors. The second is for team morale. I'm a huge believer in the importance of team morale. Whenever I meet with my one-on-ones with um, people in my company, the first thing I ask them is, are you happy? I think the happy people are literally 10 times more productive than people who aren't happy. And if, you're, if your company is moving along very quickly, it, it tends to sort of make people happy and excited about, <coughs> about the pace and, and the prospect of the company. Third, from a PR perspective, it's great when you can meet with someone from the press and give statistics. And we have you know, 2 million users, whatever. And they can say, well, I just met with you two months ago. And we only had you know, 1 million users. That kind of momentum is great for press. Press loves to see the sort of fast take. And the last reason, obviously, uh, drives higher valuations. Higher valuations when you're raising money and higher valuations when you're selling a company. Um, and also, uh, you, you can give to the companies, I don't know how many people read this sort of article, I'll talk about the companies, but um, I believe in selling the company for, for maximizing value at the point when the company is still growing exponentially. But when you're growing exponentially, if you can imagine the sort of the curve, it's, it just sort of is very exciting about what the prospects are. Once your company starts growing linearly, it's very easy for acquirers or investors to say, well, I can project that out exactly what it's going to be uh, you know, two years from now. So uh, I'm going to try to contrast sort of the typical stock startup, maybe timeline, with sort of this sort of rapid, uh, rapid startup. And maybe some of these numbers are even too slow, typical, maybe this is not even typical anymore. But just for an example, take the case of, uh, of a company which takes, say, three months to sort of kick around some ideas. Maybe it takes three months to raise money. Maybe it takes a couple months to sort of hire the core team and, and open an office. And maybe it takes 12 months to really build a good product. And then there's a period of uh, you know, three to six months of sort of starting to get market awareness of, uh, uh, you know, so the whole process is 23, 20. All four of my companies have been quite different. Sort of exploring ideas is a sort of a two-week process, and we could talk more about I, I honestly believe you should not spend more than that time because you'll just find reasons not to do it. Uh, when I was a, a, you know, the longer you look at it, there'll be more reasons what other companies doing or things like that. Raising money, I have up here one day. Um, <laughs> Sometimes when I give this speech, people throw things at me, to be honest. Um, this is an aspirational speech. Um, I have been very fortunate. Um, I raised eight rounds of venture money, and seven out of the eight rounds, I did get a signed term sheet on the day I pitched. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how to, uh, you too can do this, how you can raise money the same way you um, Opening, hiring the core team and opening the office. Um, we'll talk about sort of, um, you know, execution is, is where it's at, and we'll talk about you know, how, how we did some of those. And finally, building the products. All, all of my companies, the successful product was built in three months. Um, and that is intentional in the sense that it's not you get together the you know engineering team and say, well, how long will it take? You say, okay, in three months, what can we build? And we'll talk about why you do it that way. And, and this results in a company sort of launching three and a half months or so after you sort of Okay, so many people <clears throat> um, are not that familiar with some of the companies I've done, so I just wanna sort of quickly talk to, talk to you about them. Um, the first one was called Stylus Innovation. The, the initial name of this company was Dial-A-Fish, literally Dial-A-Fish. It was going to change the way everyone ordered groceries in the United States. Um, it turned into a computer telephony software. Um, when we started, there were 95% of the market was owned by DOS-based tools. Um, and then the typical competitor had 300 customers. We were the first Windows-based tool, and we shipped 3,000 copies of our product in the first year. It was a very simple company. Um, this one, uh, 
you can see we sold it for 13 million, uh, which is tiny for Silicon Valley standards. The nice thing about that one is uh, there was only $1,500 in investment in that company. I put in $500. Each of my two partners put in $500. So it's got a 10,000x uh, ROI, I guess, on that one. Um, and the thing about this company is you'll see from three out of my four companies, the original idea was a disaster. It had to change direction, and, the, and this one, as we were building this uh, dial up the dial fish product, it was, um, I hate to admit my age, but it was before the internet, and you'd, you'd have in your house, you'd have, as you're throwing away your box of cereal, you'd take a pen-sized wand and you'd scan it over the barcode on the product, it would go over the telephone, convert the barcode into touch tones, and those touch tones would be understood by a computer, which would then know you know the product you're throwing away and have it ready the next time you go to the store, sort of packaged up, this is pre-web band too. Um, well, it turns out, as a process of building that product, we realized that all of the tools out there for building interactive force response applications, the applications which link uh, telephones and touch tones to, to computers, were terrible. These were these DOS-based tools when we built the first one. Okay. The second company was Direct Hit. Direct Hit was, a, was an internet search engine based on tracking what sites people clicked on and how much time they spent there. And this was launched in uh, uh, 1998. At the time we launched, we were on the cover of a magazine called Industry Standard with, with Google. Um, and um, it was, it was uh, we sort of, someone spent five seconds at the site, we penalized it. If someone spent five minutes at the site, we rewarded it. Uh, but anyway, we provided search results for um, AOL, uh, Microsoft, Lycos. Um, and we got this AOL deal within five months of the company starting. I'll talk about that company a little bit more. And that was the one. 500 days after we launched for $500 million. So that was a fair New England return also. Um, the third one, uh, Xfire, was this instant messenger for PC video gamers. Um, it was, the beautiful thing about this product was uh, it was a viral spreading product. Uh, you, could, you could look at your instant messenger and you could see your friends showing up in this, in this your I am client, and you can see what online game they were playing. These are sort of shooter games, you know, Doom and Quake and things like that. And um, you could just click on your friend's name and it would launch you into the same game your friend would play. Well, the great thing about this product was it was completely useless to you unless your friends were also using it. Which means anyone who touched the product had to go get their friends to use it. In fact, it was extremely viral. The average user got five of his friends in the first three weeks to start using the product. Um, this, this grew to, uh, to 3 million users in two years. We sold it to MTV for $100 million. And uh, it was sort of a, a, you know, a, new, a new segment. And also you'll see from the companies I've done, one was computer telephony, one was internet search, one was you know, instant messenger for PC video gamers, and another one was um, sort of recommendation engine. All different space. Um, I love going to different spaces, and I also encourage people. If they say, oh, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert in that space. Or I think that's great. Sometimes people new to the space are not sort of entrenched in the ideas. You know, people who have been there too long say you can never do that. Um, and also, it's fun for me because in the beginning, nobody calls me back. Uh, you know, even my third or fourth company in the new space, I have no reputation in that space. So nobody calls you back. It's very frustrating in the beginning. But over time, um, you know, then like nine months, twelve months into it, when is Let's see, the fourth company, Ruba, was uh, based on recommendations based on your friends thing. Um, and that was, uh, that had, again had to morph from, uh, uh, the first idea really didn't catch on, we sort of turned it into a travel site, and that's when we sold to, uh, to Google. Okay, so how do you speed up all the parts of a startup? Whether it's, and these are the things I, you know, raising money, Opening your office, hiring people—you know what you do for new employees, getting them started. Um, how do you speed up the product development process, business development, marketing, and how do you speed up the fact the process of changing direction? We're going to talk through each one of those. So fundraising. Um, not a lot of money has gone into uh, sort of the companies I've done, which I think is also very encouraging for hopefully people in this room. It's not like you have to go raise ten million dollars as your first step. Again, Stylus was the one was fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, direct hit. Uh, was the Series A was only a 1.3 million dollar um, investment, and that's the one I pitched D DFJ at uh, 8:15 in the morning, and they gave me, they found me, they tracked me down, and gave me a term sheet at 4:30 um, that afternoon. And we didn't even invest, we didn't even spend that much money. Um, we got Hotbot as a customer, and AOL and Apple, and we'd only spent 400,000 dollars at that point. 
And then even though we, we got Microsoft and Lycos as customers of our search engine, we'd only spend another $600,000. Uh, Xfire um, was only a sort of million dollar series A round. Um, and I talk here at the bottom about this business school philosophy of you know, having a single consistent strategy. So if your strategy is speed, um, it, I think it also applies to fundraising. Uh, basically, it's, it's faster to raise lower money. It's, it's faster to raise less money than to raise the, the bigger rounds. And also, raising lower money forces you to be faster. You, you don't have that much money. You're going to run out of money soon, so you have to move quickly. Um, and so how, how do you raise sort of this venture capital money quickly, you know, sort of the same day close? So here's some things that I do. Um, first of all, you know, some of this is obviously obvious, but obvious, but sort of the examples. Raise when the conditions are totally in your favor. And to me, that doesn't necessarily mean just following a key event, but sometimes right before a key event. For example, I talk here about direct hit series B. When we're about to close the AOL deal, where AOL is going to start using our uh, search engine as, as, as part of the results for them, I was approaching venture capitalists and saying, I guarantee you, my valuation is going to go up next week when I close the AOL deal. So if you want to you know, come, now is the time to do it. And we did the same thing when we were raising money for the Microsoft and Lycos. We knew the well, for the Microsoft and Lycos deal. We knew those deals were going to close, and we raised money just before that. Um, second thing is getting all the decision makers in the room. When I talk to investors, I tell them, uh, uh, "This is moving very quickly, and so um, I'm very excited you're you're going to willing to meet with us." And but I need to have all of your decision makers in the room for that meeting. And some people will say, "You know, go jump in a lake," but some of them will say, "Wow, you know this." This person really must have something if they have the, you know, temerity to say get all the decision makers in the room. And sure enough, you're gonna you're gonna avoid the delays you get sometimes with you know meet with, uh, you know first this uh, associate and then come back and meet with one partner and then come back and meet with two partners and then just don't do that. Um, my advice is try to get all the decision makers there. Third thing is obvious obvious synchronize your timing of your offers. Um, and I will be very upfront with them. I'm saying. Yes, I'm meeting with uh, you know one firm at ten o'clock, one with you know one o'clock, one at you know three o'clock, and I'm expecting a term sheet at you know five o'clock today. And it's, again, it's just quite a bold approach, but they sort of get this feeling that you know something something is coming. And sort of in a more concrete thing you can do is I love to bring what I call if-then contracts to my VC meetings. And an if-then contract, I will get a customer basically, a customer uh, with with uh, with direct hit. We um, I got AltaVista and InfoSeek to both basically write me a letter saying, um, yes, it, Mike, if you design a search engine that has 50 millisecond response time and 80% of our users think your search results are better than our current search results, sure, we'll use your results and we'll pay you $1 per thousand results. You know, these companies are not too worried about signing a letter like that. It's, it's probably not even legally binding. It's, um, you know, they don't have any. They don't really think you're going to get to achieve what you just said you, you do. But when you walk into the venture capitalist with that letter in hand, you basically eliminated 50% of the things they worry about. They worry about whether you build to sell, will you have customers. Now you said yes, I've got customers. The other thing I worry about is, you know, technically, can you build it? So in all the cases I've, I've done, I've gotten together before going to the venture capitalist, and like with with Directive, we had um, this really excellent database um, de designer, and we, we we did a Gantt chart. What the sort of the development of the product is going to take. It's going to take you know, 12 weeks. It's going to have these three people working on it. These are the tasks. The VCs have no idea whether this Gantt chart is right or not. Um, but they say, well, this person, they thought it through. Maybe I feel good about the technical risk I'm taking. And these are things you can do before you go and meet with a, with a venture capitalist. And again, it's going to show that your thinking is, I focus on a customer, and I focus on how to build it. And I think it, it goes along with getting those. And the next thing, opening an office. Um, you know, I'm just very proud about sort of the, the the nuts and bolts, the execution of things. So we, we raised this money. This is the one. This is the direct hit one, uh, where we got the term sheet on the, on the same day that morning. Um, before I even got on the plane to fly back, I called the developers in Boston and said, because um, this was actually based in Boston, you know, quit your job. We're going to start. You know, the next day was negotiating a lease on office space and ordering the computers and you can see all the steps. You know, the network software, the phone system, the alarm system, incorporating, setting the bank account. Just got to be really good at executing all these things so that you know, 11 days later, you can open an office with everything, you know, everything there, and it's just your speed is, is you're hitting everything with speed. I apply the same thing to hiring. Um, now, first of all, um, this is sort of a little look at the type of uh, people I've, I've hired in my companies, and you'll see that a lot of them have um, sort of a lot of experience because I, um, you know, I love. Um, sort of the energy and enthusiasm of people right out of school, 
but in my experience, it's been, uh, you know, a developer who's got five or seven years of development can be so much faster. And a lot of these companies were built with, with just three developers. Uh, Xfire and DirectHit were built, this core product was built with three developers. And I, I talk about 20x developers or 30x developers. To me, that means someone, literally, who can, one developer can do the work of, in, in, you know, in one day can do what's, what it'll take, you know, another developer 20 days to do. Um, and you can find those people. So anyway, uh, look for people with experience in my background, and all, all these people, often they are people I've worked with before. Um, you can see, you know, Stylus, 13 out of the 15 I've worked with before. <coughs> 12 out of the 15 I've worked with before. And how do we hire people quickly? Um, one of the things I like to do is have all the interviews done on the same day. So people come in, and they might have five interviews or six interviews starting at, you know, noon or something like that. But as the interviews are going along, if I find someone who's people like, yeah, this person is good, I will do a real-time reference check at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or something. And all my friends are used to this now. They're like, oh, this is another reference check. You need an answer within a half an hour. I'm like, yes, it is. Um, but it sort of builds this momentum. And you never take the references people give you. You always you know, find where they've been and find someone you know through your network who's been at that company who can speak, and you know, speak about them. So do all the interviews on the same day. At the end of the day, before they walk out, you hand them an offer letter and you say, we're really excited. We're giving you an offer. Are you ready to join? And they say, whoa, wow, I didn't expect this. I need to you know, <laughs> think about this. And you say, great, I don't want to rush you. Can you call me at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning and let me know? Um, <laughs> but seriously, that's the kind of intensity that sort of you, you can avoid getting in these, you know, bidding wars with someone else trying to get them. You, you avoid getting them cold feet. You know, if they think about it for too long, they don't want to join. And again, it sets the pace. So when they come to your company, they're sort of expecting this, this sort of pace. Same thing with getting new employees started. Um, for me, sort of, it's a cardinal sin to have someone start and they're all excited the first day and you're like, ah, the computer's not quite set up yet, your email account's not quite set up yet, we, you know, we forgot to order the, uh, you know, the source control license, so you read these manuals or something like that, that's a sin. Um, you, before they come, you should have them doing their, you know, their, whatever it is, W2 paperwork and all that stuff, don't do that the first day they come. And when they come, you should have every single piece of hardware and software ready for them um, you know, start when they come. And you should have the task list set up. Here's the task, here's the project. Um, first of all, it's very efficient. Second of all, talk about setting the tone, setting the pace, the intensity. When someone walks into an environment like that, they're like, all right, this is for real. Um, okay, product development. We're gonna make this an interactive, se interactive session. Um, and this is actually a, a tough choice. So you have, to, you have to decide. If you have a choice between incremental development, where you're just gonna sort of build sort of one feature and then, um, you know, add another module maybe a little bit later and then add another module, keep, keep adding features as you go and sort of listen to the market and, and add features. Or your choice too is, no, 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 you gotta do a really job, you have to spec carefully, you have to do good research because you, you don't just wanna design in a vacuum and you wanna make sure you, you get the product with a very good product the first time because you're only gonna get one impression. Once someone tries your product, if they don't like it, they're not gonna come back and try it again. So how many think option A is the way to go for speedy development? How many people think option B? Okay, so I've always gone with option A. Um, and it, it's, it's tricky because they're both sort of compelling solutions, but um, all the products I've launched, the very first version 1.0 of the product has been extremely simple. Um, this the first computer telephony product um, you know, eventually it was a, it was a digital system and handled, uh, you know, 64 simultaneous lines. It had, it had fax and, and all this, you know, voice, you know, um, auto attend and all this stuff. The very first version, it handled two lines, analog lines on telephone. That's all it did. Um, same thing with, um, with direct hit, this, this, uh, the search engine. The first version we launched, all it did was count clicks. This site has been clicked on. 17 times, this one's been clicked on 46 times. Pick that. It didn't include any of this timing, three seconds, five seconds. It didn't include, you know, US Open tennis versus, uh, you know, versus whatever you <coughs> want, golf by time of year. It was a very simple version. Then we just add features as we go along. It simplifies your development effort, it simplifies your marketing effort, and, and it just is a much, I think it's a much faster way to go. Okay. Um, yes, so here are some of these examples I just want to just talk, talk through about the different features. Okay, business development. How can you close business development deals quickly? So I have this saying, I have all these little silly sayings in my companies and people always, one of my sayings is the chance of anything good happening is never greater than 
um, which people really annoys people when I say that. Another thing I always say is, uh, what can go wrong? And um, people, when developers come into my office and say, yes, it's going to work perfectly, I would just say, what can go wrong? So one of the ones I say is the probability of any deal ever closing declines by 10% for every day it does not close. And I really believe this. So um, it, it changes your behavior. If you're, if you're starting to deal with someone who you think it's going to be you know, a two, three, four week, five week, six week cycle, I will just say to them, you know what, if, I don't, if we don't close this deal today or tomorrow, I just don't think it's going to close and I'll be much more bolder. And it, it, at first I was really scared. I was like, oof, you know, if, if I push them too hard and I don't get the deal, then you know, maybe I'm making a mistake. But then I realized over time that, at least in my experience, everyone is so busy and they only have maybe you know, two or three things that are at the top of the list they can get done in any given day. And if you're not on that list of things that are going to get done that day, you're not, going to get, you're not going to get done. And it's going to be the same next day. You're going to be number seven on the list the next day and number seven on the list the next day. So I push, you might not be surprised, but I push um, to get the deals closed. Um, and all the deals, let's say take direct hit, the deal with Microsoft was done in 10 days. This is a deal where we basically provide search results um, at the top of Microsoft search results list. That was done in 10 days. The AOL deal was also done in about two weeks. Um, and the ones that took longer, you know, the, um, the InfoSeq deal, the AltaVista deal, those stretched into months and months and they actually never closed. Um, also, the sort of limited supply thing, and this is a standard thing, right? Limited supply. Oh, well, we've already sold the sponsorships for July, August, and October. September is still available, but there's someone else who wants it. I mean, that's a stupid trick you've all heard a million times, but that stuff works. People, like, they feel a deadline, it feels a limited supply, on, on maps, if there are, like, certain regions that are all being taken up, that just drives people crazy. Like, they're, they're gonna lose out, they're gonna miss. The biggest thing you can get to, to get people to get to move is their fear of their competitors. You talk about what their competitors are doing, and I'm, you know, I'm very open. Uh, I tell people, um, yeah, of course I'm talking to your competitors, and I don't, t I don't reveal any, you know, confidences. But I say, well, I just want you to know I, that I've warned you, and if you see the announcement of us partnering with your competitors, don't say I didn't warn you, and that drives me crazy. Anyway. <laughs> um, marketing. So um, another way of moving fast is, um, you know, this sort of tension between marketing or PR and marketing. And I'm going to usually end up annoying a lot of people in the world who are like big fans of marketing. But PR has worked much faster for me than marketing. Marketing has, you know, delays in it. There's a delay in the creation of the marketing material. There's, there's a delay in both uh, coming up with what the ideas are and then actually production of it. And if I just look back at my companies, you know, Stylus had no marketing budget at all. Um, we were sort of, um, our, our strategy was to get editorial in Computer Telephony Magazine. And we were on the cover of, in, of Computer Telephony Magazine, I think, three times in the first year we were at. Direct we had no marketing budget. We were on the cover of Industry Standard. Um, and a lot of times, the way you get these, I used to have this, um, this sort of fancy. I, I, I wished, uh, um, I wished that, that Star Wars was real. You know, the Force in Star Wars. You know, when the, mm -hmm. they use the Force and they say, I wish I could use the Force and make that person sign this purchase order or whatever. Um, make this investor, you know, give me a million dollars with using the force. But then I realized that actually it, it, it does, it's true, you can do stuff with the force if you can become a persuasive, um, you know, the charisma or whatever. And um, I think that, uh, you know, if you, can, if you can get, you can do that with press too. Uh, press loves to deal with the actual entrepreneur because all day long they're dealing with you know, they're dealing with PR people, and that's their job. Their, their, their job is to go and pitch the companies. But um, it's, it's much harder for the, the, uh, the reporter to believe, you know, when the PR person says, oh, this is the greatest product, you know, I've ever seen, than the real, you know, entrepreneur. So uh, I've always tried doing it directly myself. Okay, change of direction. So um, sort of as I mentioned before, um, which again, I hope is encouraging to people, because I mean, maybe some people are working on things now and maybe it's not quite working. Um, well, been there. Three out of my four, the first, it did not work. Um, dial a fish we talked about. Um, and once we, I think the key is, once you decide it's not working, you have to be very decisive when you change direction. I think a lot of companies, first of all, a lot of companies, it's kind of sad to watch. They, they sort of just death spiral in. And it's not working and it's not working and it's not working and they just crater. And they don't just change. Other ones, they sort of tentatively change. They say, yeah, we've been at this for a year and we have two customers. I don't, I'm not sure it's working, but so let's
take 15% of the company and we're going to work on this new idea as an experiment. Or I think that's wrong. I think once you know it's not working, you've got to move the entire company immediately. Like you can see here, some of these. The decision to change to visual voice took less than two weeks, and we moved the whole company over to visual voice. With Xfire, when we switched, the original Xfire didn't start as um, an instant messenger for PC video games. It started as Ultimate Arena, which was a place that people were going to come online to play these tournaments. They're going to put a dollar in, and they're going to win money against their uh, other people online. Once we decided to change direction, it took two weeks to change, and we, we switched the majority of the company right away. Same thing with Ruba, my fourth company. I mean, look at how many names we went through. You know, friends, tips, and then Kudo, and then Ruba. Um, you know, when we tried to change, it, we uh, we moved 100% of the company over. All right, so this is just the last sort of last sort of aspirational one, and then I get into questions because I've done these talks a few times and people mostly enjoy the Q&A. So anyway, um, this was direct hit where we, and some people who are into finance will love sort of the, um, sort of the, the, the multiples. So we raised Series A at 1.3 on 2.6 pre. And that's the one where we opened our doors, uh, you know, 11 days later. We signed the deal with Hotbot, which was like the fourth biggest search engine, um, you know, a month after we opened our doors. So there's no way the product was done. But we got them to agree, yes, okay, with a real signed contract, yes, we'll do this, We'll pay this much. And then two months later, the product was done, and um, we launched with them. Once we got Hotbot as a customer, we were able to get AOL and Apple. And right as we're closing the AOL deal, that's when we did our Series B, which is two on 23 million pre. And then we got sort of our, our link had gone from a link at the top of search result list to becoming the default re results on Hotbot. And then we got the Lycos and Microsoft deal. And as we're closing those deals again, we used this you know, time to raise. We raised 26 at 100 pre. And then we launched this destination website, and this was this is the one that sold to our to five hundred million. So um, I'd love to take questions. Other questions? Go ahead. I do fundraising. First of all, if your valuation is going up next week because you have those deals closing, why don't you wait and get a better deal from the VCs? Secondly, with development cycles that are so short and so little money raised, why even bother raising the money? Um, okay. So um, why do I leave money on the table? Um, I leave money on the table all the time because I don't believe in winning um, a negotiation. Uh, I, and I have this, this is one of my sayings, I want anyone who's ever invested in me, anyone who's ever worked in one of my companies, any business development deal I've ever done to want to do another deal with me. So I always leave money on the table. Also I think that um, I'll, I'll give up money for speed um, anytime. So you know, if someone is willing to give me, say, what, 1.3 to 2.6 pre today. I'll take that over maybe next week getting you know two million and four three or five because I have this huge discount rate on the value of time. I mean like enormous discount rate, and so to me it's worth worth the time. And the second question was um, why raise money at all? So I've had very good relationships with the investors I've had, um, and so it's not just the money. I mean. And, I didn't even need to really raise money for my second, third, and fourth companies. I could have just self-funded out of the money I made before. But the investors I had um, did a couple things for me. One is um, they really would sort of challenge me, and you know, during monthly board meetings, they'd say, "Well, why are you doing that way? You know, this person over here does it this way." Um, and even the original idea, they'd say, "Well, are you sure you want to do that?" And the second thing is. You know, I'm, like many people in this room, probably a very big believer in the power of, of your network and your connections. And the, the introductions made for me by the investors I've had have been invaluable. I mean, DFJ introduced me to the AOL deal that got me that one. And Benchmark, I mean, unbelievable in terms of, you, you want to talk to the CEO of Verizon? Sure, tomorrow. It happens. Um, other questions? You're optimizing your situation. Yeah. Your situation and your investor's situation, but after a while, the company is buying your company. How, how do they do in general? And are they then poisoning the opportunity the next time around? No, no, in Not fact, um, yeah. Well, put it this way. I can, I've, I've yeah. gone in behind the companies who were struggling like that. Sure, them. I'm well aware of the problem. So um, one data point is the first quarter after um, Google bought us, at the end of that quarter, their market cap went up $17 billion, which I take full responsibility for. Um, uh, the second company, well, Stylus. When, when, uh, when Artisoft bought Stylus, um, they basically eventually completely closed out all their other product lines, and the only product they sold was ours. And um, 
So I think it was a great sort of validation that we weren't just sort of a junk. Direct hit um, was bought by Ask Jeeves, and that's a tricky one. Um, it was kind of um, kind of tricky timing because that happened right as sort of the bubble was bursting in the spring of 2000. Um, I think most people agree that the technology we brought was sort of very valuable to Ask Jeeves. Um, I think the jury is kind of out on um, you know whether how successful that was for them. X Fire. Um, when, when, when MTV bought us, we had 3 million users. Um, about two years after that, we had 15 million users. So, um, you know, I think from a user growth perspective, it was, it was pretty good. But, go ahead. Uh, if, I was, if I was buying one of your companies, yeah. I would want you. Yeah. I would um, want to keep you, because you're the, you're the creative genius. Um, and many companies struggle when that creative genius. Well, Google, Google, Google is doing a really good job at uh, treating me really well so far. So uh, we'll see how <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Oh, go ahead. So you first. Um, oh, I no, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, the question is, did you use uh, bankers when you sold your companies? And in general, was it a proactive sale from your part? Or did they solicit you and you just uh, jumped into Right. Them? Great question. Um, I'm, I'm not. In general, I don't believe you can sell your company. I think that companies buy companies, but it's almost impossible to like knock on a door and say, hey, buy me, buy me, buy me. Because the fact you're knocking on the door saying, buy me, is kind of a big red flag saying, uh, there must be something wrong. Um, now, you can introduce yourself to companies by working on strategic partnerships with them, and then let them come to the conclusion they want to buy you. Um, but no, I never called a company and said, you know, buy me. And